Right. Now, let's change tack a little bit. So we've talked about what we do if we were, you know, at the start of a mining project, we were thinking about new ways that we could apply technologies to look for that value. But if we have existing waste, you know, what are we going to do when we get to site? So that's a question that myself and the team get asked a lot. Um, sometimes it's like the number one question. Well, people understand there could be something to do, but they don't know what it is. So Laura is now going to take us through her experiences um, as someone who's solved a lot of mine waste in her life. And she's going to sort of talk to us about, you know, good techniques and new techniques that we should be looking to developing in the future. So thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Anita, for the introduction. Um, great. So I uh, will skip over to the first slide. Um, OK, and hit play on this video. So this is a video or a drone footage, so thank you done for taking this and it's just across a tailing stand so as we're talking about tailing sampling today I really want you to have a think about what would you do if you got to this site um, this is a drone footage from wall to wall and so you're getting a really nice idea of scale about how big some of these sites can be so what would you do would you rock up to site dig a few holes would you um, plan some excavator holes, would you take a drill rig out? And if you did these things, at what stage of a project would you do those? Um, as you've heard from Anita and Lauren, in incorporating as much information that other areas of the mine are collecting into these programs is really vital. So what information do the geomets have? Do they know what's going into their tails? Um, on Anita's uh, point on acid mine drainage, are there any leachate points? This is a big pot of tailings, if you can measure high concentrations of copper or zinc or lead in the leachate coming from um, a dam seepage point, then it's going to give you a good indication as to what might be in those tailings. And therefore you can start to plan around what you're going to do with this site. So today we're going to have a think and talk about a few different techniques and where you would start. So first, you really want to start with this desktop study, incorporating data from a lot of different areas if it's um, available and if it exists. Um, then maybe you would start with grab sampling, excavator sampling. It's uh, pretty simple. It doesn't cost a lot. It's um, effective if you know nothing about the site. Um, we'll have a look at a few case examples. Then you can go to hand organ, which is relatively um, easy. It does take a little bit of manpower to get there, but you can get some really good information and detail on the different horizons through there. Not all sites, however, are dry, like the video you saw before. Quite a few sites we've worked on in Tasmania especially, or where the um, weather is a bit wetter all year round, most of the tailing stands have some sort of water cover, if not fully water covered. So how do you go about selecting or sampling tailings below one metre, 10 metres, 50 metres, 100 metres of water, um, whatever it might be. So as you're moving through your program, then we're going to have a look at power auger, air core drilling and sonic drilling and some of those further along um, influence you might um, implement. So if we're talking about grab sampling, it might sound really simple and really rudimentary and you might be thinking, why would we even do this? But these are two examples from two honours projects. So the top example is from Rob McLean and the bottom example is from Lexi King, two different sites in Tasmania. But sometimes with our projects, it's a budget thing. If you don't have a lot of budget, how do you collect the most amount of information in the easiest possible way? So both examples here have had an excavated digger trench. Um, they've taken photos. Uh, you can implement scale tools so you can look at these photos later uh, and each one has logged based on a facies or it's like a unit code or a lithology um, sort of taking a sedimentology approach so the pros of this uh, idea are it's cheap um, it's relatively portable you can put an excavator on a truck and drive it uh, anywhere that you can get to you can get really large sample volumes and you can get this visual stratigraphic log which you can lose with other techniques um, the cons are is the depth that you can get to, the difficulty if the hole does get too deep, you can't physically get in there. Um, and if it gets really saturated, the hole fills up with water and the walls can uh, slide in. So pros and cons to both. Um, but if you did do this, this is a nice example from a PhD student called Sibeli. So she had some trench samples dug out at Macquarie Harbour and wanted to make more use of those. So what she's done is taken a whole heap of photos 
across her trench and use some software to turn this into a 3D model. So as you can see here, you can go back in, you can zoom, you can re-establish what horizons you're looking at, you can mark on where you took your samples from. Um, she again has a stick in here that's got 10 centimetre marks on it, so you can go back through and log um, vertically. And as you know, there's never enough time in the field, so you often miss things. So I really love this example as a way to go back over and reassess what you've sampled. So then you would move on to something um, that we call called hand augering or soil augering. You might have done this in school. Quite a few of us and quite a few of GSQ staff members have done a lot of this recently. So the, probably the biggest con is that it does take a fair bit of physical effort. Um, a pro is that you can get anywhere from one to 10 metres relatively quickly and you don't need to move any equipment onto a site. You can pack it up into a shoulder bag, walk it out onto the site and get samples relatively simply. It's cheap, it's portable, you can retain the stratigraphy. Um, I'll show you a photo in a minute, but these two auger heads are two that we've had a lot of success with. So the bottom um, auger head here, really good if the tailings or the material soil, um, whatever you're looking at is dry. Um, and the top uh, example is when it starts to get a bit more thick, a bit clayed and a bit saturated. So it just holds the sample in there a bit more. So with these programs and what we do in terms of doing a desktop study is pull up a few images of the site, get as much information from um, the company or if it's a government owned one as you can. And then we drop a grid across it and you just try to do as best representation as you can. So with this example on a hundred metre grid space, that's about 30 holes. And this is what this material from a hole would look like. So looking at the top left hand of this image, this is the very surface of the sample. And each time you put that auger head down, it fills up with material. And then you just stack your material uh, left to right uh, in a meter fashion. And then you continue. So this is zero to one meter, one to two meter and so on. And even from here, you can start to see that there's an oxidized zone and you can start to pick out the depths and that it is um, relatively fresh uh, to, to depth there. And again, with these samples, you can do the same similar thing that we were doing with the excavator trenches. So you can start to log them and use spaces. So then each site has its own logging code. And then you can start to plot up whatever chemistry or analysis you've done with those logs. So what happens if your tailings dam is covered in water? And this is probably one of the trickier situations that you can be in, but not impossible. So anything that's got shallow water, so maybe one to five metres, if you can't get a boat or a barge on it, that depth is really hard to sample from. But if you can get something floating on the surface, you can use any one of these two instruments. So the first one here is called a piston sediment corer. So what happens is it's got this trip core at the bottom, which is weight, and you drop it off the side of the boat. And as it hits the sediment, it sits off a trip and forces this, which is a PVC pipe or a clear pipe forced into a mechanism, and it drives it into the tailings. And then here you can see that it's being pulled up vertically, and then you have a metre and a metre and a half, two metres um, of sediment retained uh, in that core. Another version is uh, called a weighted hammer sediment core. Um, so here, similar idea is that a PVC pipe is pushed up into the mechanism. And these are weights here that have ropes that come up the top. So you pull the weights on the rope and drop it down. There's a video next because it's hard to visualize if you've um, not seen it. But the pros here is that you can recover tailings from um, beneath the water cover. Again, it's a bit physical if the pipe gets unmanageable more than two metres, but two metres of tailings that you've never sampled before is still great information. So hopefully this video is gonna work. I'm just give it a second to load. So this is an example from a company called UE Tech who create um, a weighted piston corer that we use. Um, if that's not gonna load, I will move on. But hopefully it will. Here we go. So this is the example I was saying with weights. So this is a clear PVC pipe. Um, it's got a bit of a mechanism that fits in here and it's got a set of weights that go around, around here. And as you pull the levers up, the weights hammer the core into the sediment. And then when it's full or you feel like it's full, 
you use the weights to then pull the whole equipment with the sample in the tube to the surface. And it has a mechanism at the top that seals it. So as soon as you get close to the surface, you just plug the bottom and your sediment is retained in that uh, PVC pipe. So a case study using this equipment. So this is um, Joanna Van Balen, a previous honours student of Anita's, who sampled the Princess Creek in Tasmania. And this is her with the UE Tech. Um, the equipment's here, and she has 1.5 metre PVC pipes, which she loaded in here. Um, she had a set of transects. So again, the idea of looking at what you can and where you can sample and what's logical. Um, she took 21 cores to 1.5 metres and then has plotted these up. This is transect A, which is running down along here. And you can see that because she has logged these for the site, for the logging scheme that she created, you can start to look at some horizontal con continuances and see how homogenous or non-homogenous the um, tailings material is. Right, so this is moving on to something a bit more electronic um, because you don't always want to have to do things by hand. This is a really nice example from Dando and it's not a plug for the company. It's just a video that you can watch while I talk about. So if we're talking about power augering, we've done some tailing sites with something that comes on a truck um, and it's got like a corkscrew auger that goes down. Um, but you can get something a bit smaller. So this dando is 80 centimetres wide. It can be driven into a site. So if it's uh, remote or abandoned and there are rehabilitation that's going on, you won't disturb the whole site to get your sampling. But it's the same sort of um, augering idea. It's got uh, drill rods, you can case it and you can pull up material from depth um, fairly easily. I think that's got some information on how quickly and how deep um, they say they can go. The one thing with augering, power augering, using the corkscrew kind of attachment is that you do lose some of that horizontal um, stratigraphy. So these are some samples here from this trip and you can get bulk half metre idea of where that sample came from. But doing something like this that again has a PVC line tube means that you can retain your stratigraphy and then you can light in and, and core trays like this and go back and log at a time that suits you. Uh, so moving on again, bigger equipment, greater depths, faster time, less manpower. So this is um, an example, and Anita mentioned Tick Hill, so it's nice that the um, talks align. So this is air core drilling at Tick Hill, and they used that um, for their pre-feasibility for this tailings reprocessing, and that's back in 2015. So you can jump on and have a look. It's got um, drilling rates and how depths and what they recovered from there. But it uses a compressor and um, blades to drive down into the tailings. Um, the sample contamination is minimized because you can uh, put like tube the holes. Um, it doesn't require a casing if you don't need it. So it's both good both ways and it's fairly quick. So the next type of drill rig you'd go for would be a sonic drilling. So this just uses sonic vibration um, created in the drill head uh, up here and it drives the drill rod down into the tailings and you can get really nice recovery of continuous sediment cores. Um, so with the recovery of this one, you can put them again straight into core trays. Uh, this is a nice example from Finland and they look like really intact because actually it's frozen. So knowing what environment you're going into, even though you've got a drill rig is still really important. Um, recently, we were down in Tasmania and we were doing sonic drilling and our material was fully saturated. It also rained the entire week that we were doing this other than a couple of nice photos. But because the material was so saturated, we used these plastic bags um, to capture the sample. So these holes were cased because otherwise they would fall in and you wouldn't know what material you were sampling. So the holes were cased, the drill rod went down, comes back up and these are bagged per metre of sample and then put into drill trays. The advantage of this is it was really quick. You can get down to 20 metres in the blink of an eye. And then from there, it does take a little bit longer, but I was so impressed with how quickly you could get. We did six holes. The maximum depth of one of the holes was 63 metres. You can go back and photograph everything. The con for this is that because it's bagged, the first centimetre or two of that material, once you've cut it open, 
is from anywhere. So if you remove the first two centimetres, you can start to get a really good visual of what kind of material is going on in the right setting. And this is just an example of exactly that. So here, if you look through the blur, um, the first centimetre of tailings is removed. But as soon as you get through that, this um, type of equipment, it really retains the stratigraphy. Like these bands are tiny and they're still, they're undisturbed, they're not stretched. So it's a really awesome um, way to go sampling. But what is the dream? There's really easy things. Like if you walk out and you can auger, sure, like I'm sure Lauren can tell you, um, how hard that is if you wanted to do a full program and each and I fair well know. So the dream would be to have some sort of tail rover like the Mars rover here to be able to go out with you to drive core into the ground, to move sediment. And then if you can have some of these techniques like Lauren was talking about and Olivia will talk about, like XRF or XRD built into these rovers, what can we start to characterise in the field to really start identifying what are the important samples and really speeding this on? Uh, so that's a quick snapshot of sampling tailings today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Laura. And uh, may I say, it's always a pleasure to go out in the field sampling with you because I'm very much the field assistant and you're very much the expert and I enjoy being, being told what to do because you know what you're doing. So that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us today.